Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Um, as you can see, I'm able to greet you from All Saints Church this morning. Later in the service, Jules will be preaching from another of our church buildings, and as usual, members of our congregations will be participating from their homes and gardens. Now, lovely though it is to see familiar faces, we must remember that each one of us participating in this service this morning, who we can't see, yet through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, are equally present in our hearts. Now, when the news came that um, clergy would be allowed to go alone into our churches to pray or to film services such as these, um, Jules and I discussed what we would do. Now, as I put the phone down from Jules, a message came into my inbox, and it was a verse from the Psalms, and it was sent from a friend who daily sends these words of encouragement. It was from Psalm 18, verse 19, and this is what it said. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. So, I greet you from this spacious place. You know, it's a step forward from my little study and a sign that we're moving forward through these difficult times. A sign, too, of God's love for us and his delight in us, his children. So, let us begin. We come from scattered lives to meet with God. Let us recognise his presence with us. As God's people, we are gathered. Let us worship him together. Lord, speak to us, that we may hear your word. Move among us, that we may behold your glory. Receive our prayers, that we may learn to trust you. Amen. Now we are joined together in our first hymn.
know that through the cross, God can forgive all the wrong things which we, as humans, do, whether they're intentional or not. We need only to come before him to say sorry and intend to turn away from sin as we go forth into our future. The grace of God has dawned upon the world with healing for all. Let us come to him in sorrow for our sins, seeking healing and salvation. We say together, Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. O the almighty and merciful Lord, grant you pardon and forgiveness for all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song we will praise our God. Now we say together some verses from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord our God. Raise the roof to the rock of rescue. Come into the presence of the Lord with thanks. Raise the rafters with songs of praise. The Lord is a great God over all, greater than every other power. He holds the depths of the earth in his hands, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The ocean is the Lord's, it was made by God. The land was formed by his own hands. Come, let us bow before the Lord our Maker. With humble hearts we worship God. The Lord is God and we are his. We are the shepherd's very own flock. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. And now we have our readings. Today's reading is taken from Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendour of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might. 
so that all the people might know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendour of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name for ever and ever. Titus 3 verses 1 to 8. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility towards all men. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Where the 
Well, good morning and a welcome to you uh, from the Church of St. Dennis in Stanford Dingley. Uh, it's one of the uh, churches in our, in our parishes and it's lovely to be able to be back here to uh, preach uh, to you this morning. And it's been a while since we've been able to be in our, our churches. And although we're not able to meet here uh, as a, for worship just yet, uh, we're able to come into our churches to, to, to stream and to record services. And... Um, it's a sign that the lockdown is beginning to ease. Uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And it reminds us as well that uh, over this last, last few weeks, uh, we've managed to worship and encourage one another in different ways. Um, the church is the people, not the buildings. But the buildings are important because they, uh, we need somewhere to meet. Uh, and these churches like these have resonated with Christian worship uh, for hundreds of years. And uh, this morning I want us to think about uh, worship. Uh, worship is perhaps one of the most central characteristics of Christian faith. You could say that it is what we're made for and saved for. Uh, the Westminster a confession, which was a state of faith that came out in the 17th century, um, has a, attached to it uh, the Westminster Catechism. And uh, the Catechism there asks a series of questions to help us to understand more of our faith and to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And the first question, the very first question that it asks is this, what is the chief end of man? What is the chief end of man? What are we here for? What's our meaning and purpose? And the answer it gives is fascinating. A wonderful answer. It gives this answer. It says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. I wonder whether we've really understood and grasped this, that our whole lives are for the glory of God. It's perhaps the noblest and most honourable thing uh, that we could do to worship and magnify uh, the God who made everything, to enjoy him, to enjoy God, to delight in him, to rejoice in him, to love him, and to do that forever. So this morning we're going to be thinking more about what it means for us uh, to do that and we're going to look further into the character of God and, and, and explore what it means to turn what we know and think and believe about God into praise. And this morning we're going to do that from Psalm 145. And the Psalms really are the Bible's hymn book. And one of the ways that we always taught our children uh, how to navigate their way around the Bible uh, is this, to, to take their Bible and split it roughly in half. And you should get a psalm. And uh, halfway again to the right and you should get a gospel. But that initial halfway mark in the psalms reminds us that praise and worship are right in the very centre of the Bible. Worship is the beating heart of Christian faith. It is the most appropriate response to who God is. 
The psalm is actually an acrostic. Every verse starts with uh, a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, and the ABC of praise, you might like to call it. So this is a, a great psalm uh, to start our thinking and shape our practice about worship. I will exalt you, my God and King, David writes. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Now there are some wonderful hymns and songs which we sing regularly in our churches and uh, our opening hymn today, uh, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, is a real favourite of mine and maybe it's a, a favourite of yours too. It's an invitation, a, a call to ourselves. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, who like thee his praise should sing? Praise him, praise him, praise the everlasting King. And for us to really engage in worship and praise, we need to know more about God, to grow deeper in our knowledge of God and our love for him. And this is the very best place to start. This psalm is full of so many different ways of describing a fitting response to who God is and what he does. Notice these words, exalt, praise, extol, celebrate, sing. And that's what praise and worship is, giving honour to God and acknowledging his character and delighting in him. It starts with thinking who God is, giving him glory and responding to all that God is, his character, his purposes, his goodness, his majesty. And what we believe about God should never stick just at the intellectual. Uh, it should direct and shape our lives and lead us to worship. Theology should lead to doxology. And that's why we have the Psalms. Uh, songs often move us, don't they? they uh, music creates an emotional response in us. And I don't think we should find it surprising that God has wired us uh, to respond emotionally to music. And worship is, of course, so much more than worship and uh, more than music and singing. Of course it is. It's about the whole of our lives to glorify God, but it's not less than those things. Imagine someone who never praises, who never gives thanks. What kind of aspect on life do you think they have? When we praise, it expands our world, our thinking. It enables us to see that we're not the centre of the universe, though we might like to think we are sometimes. Someone who never has a good word for anyone uh, or who never gave thanks would be someone we would say who was missing something, was some incomplete somehow. You see, we're made for worship. We're made for the honour and the glory of God. And we were made to enjoy God forever, to know and receive his love and his joy now and forever. God desires and deserves our praise. And the calls to worship God are misplaced if he was not worthy of them. So when a human being demands worship, adulation, adoration, it looks like what it is, uh, misplaced arrogance and pride. But when it's the living God, it is worship in its proper place. God isn't like the person who is so self-absorbed that they need constant affirmation, always needing people to tell them how amazing they are. Or the person who is so proud, who sees themselves almost like the sun, uh, around which everybody else are just planets, uh, caught in their gravitational pull, their own self-belief. God isn't like that. You know, the worship of God, the praise and adulation of God is the appropriate response to God because God is worthy of it. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. There is no limit to it, no end point to his glory. God's character is beautiful and mind-boggling at the same time. And in verse 8, we have what is perhaps one of the most central claims of the Bible when it comes to God's character. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. It is perhaps the most often repeated description of God's character we find in the Bible. And its first occurrence comes in, Psalm, in, in Exodus chapter 34. 
there Moses is on the, on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from the Lord and he asks to see the Lord. This was impossible of course because God is so holy and Moses like us so sinful but God agrees for him to see the tail end of his glory as he passes by and to hides him in the cleft of a rock as he went by so he wouldn't be overwhelmed. And we're told that God made all his goodness to pass by Moses as his name was proclaimed. So as Moses saw God's glory, he saw his goodness. That's the defining character of God. And I wonder what impression we have of God. My conversations, often with many Christians even, leads me to think that uh, over the years that people have a variety of pictures of God in their head. And not all of them are very healthy. There is the, the bearded old man sitting serenely on the clouds, surrounded by baby-faced winged cherubs strumming harps for eternity. Or there's the angry God casting down thunderbolts on people who displease him. I saw a sign outside the church once, which I hope was tongue-in-cheek, that said, trespasses will be struck by lightning. That sounds more like Zeus than the God of the Bible. It sounds also more like a, a, a grumpy a, a head teacher sitting in his study waiting to punish naughty children who step out of line, or, or the bank manager who has to be cajoled into giving us the, even the smallest loan. Trying to get anything out of God is just hard work. And with that kind of view of God, um, we think we have to bribe him with our good works, with our sacrifices, or try to placate him in case he gets angry with us. And if that is our view of God, caricatures though they are, then who would want to spend five minutes in their company, let alone a whole eternity? That God isn't worthy of eternal praise and worship. But wonderfully, that is not the God of the Bible. This is God. He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Doesn't mean though that God doesn't get angry, that God hates sin. He hates what sin does to his world, to us, to our relationship with him. But that is anger that is a consequence of love. I remember when I was very little, I was almost knocked down by a car because I wasn't looking where I was going. And my dad saw it, came rushing out and was so unbelievably cross with me. But that was because he loved me. If we think about people we love and if, they, if we saw them being badly treated, we wouldn't just say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. We'd be, we're angry. We, 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 we'd be cross with them because we love them. That's what love does when it sees wrong in the world. But God is also patient. He's not someone who flies off the handle at the smallest slight. His anger is measured, a right response to evil and sin. Because he loves. God is full of compassion and patience and love. He's full of these things. That is his character. And this is character for all the world. Verse 9 tells us, God is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. There isn't one part of creation that God doesn't have authority over, that he has no concern for, that he doesn't love. God loves all he's made. And he gives us good things, all of us. The world doesn't work the way it should do because we've turned away from his love. But yet still God provides. He provides the sun and the rain, the food that we eat, the things we enjoy. To all of them, uh, they point to a God who is good. And so what should our response be to God? We should be to give him thanks, to bless him, to, that means to acknowledge just how good he is. And wonderfully, this is a God who goes on forever. So verse 13 says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. We've endured lockdown for several weeks now and restrictions are beginning to ease a little and one day it will be over. Normal life will resume, though it might be a little different to start off with. It's hard to imagine how this could go on forever and we rightly think how horrible that is. There are some things we don't want to last forever. But God's kingdom is a kingdom of light and love and hope and peace. And that's a kingdom which does last forever. 
The future that God promises for those who have put their trust in his son, Jesus Christ, is just that. It is a solid and eternal future because God's reign lasts forever. And this God who lasts forever has concern for us. Verse 14, the Lord upholds all who fall. He lifts up all who are bowed down. In our weaknesses, in our frailties, throughout our trials, our difficulties, God's promises never stop. He promises to hold on to us when we trust in him. That's why verse 13 says, the Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. Verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, faithful in all he does. The Lord is gracious, merciful, trustworthy. He is kind. That is the character of God that shines throughout the whole Bible, in the experiences of those who have trusted him and in the person of Jesus Christ. He is righteous, which means he does good in every way. He is good in every way. Everything he does is right. And ultimately, the whole Bible, including this psalm, points to its fulfilment in the person of Jesus Christ. How is it possible to know this God and be kept by him? How can we possibly draw near to such a God and honour him? Well, in our second reading, Paul tells us that into the darkness and dismay of our fallen world, God displays his kindness and his love in sending his son, Jesus Christ, in sending a saviour. Not because of our worthiness, but because of his mercy. That is God's character, to be gracious and to show mercy. And on the cross, God showed his amazing love for us. His mercy displayed for all the universe to see person of Jesus Christ in his life and death and resurrection is the literal embodiment of God's grace and mercy, his love, his truth and his kindness. So what amazing reasons to praise God. And if you're a believer this morning in Jesus Christ, rejoice in the sure and certain and solid hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And if you're a believer, but your faith feels flat, or the whole coronavirus has knocked you for six, I urge you to go back to your Bible. Spend time in places like Psalm 145, in the Gospels, and read again and be encouraged to see the character of God which shines through. The Lord is all these things. And if you're watching this this morning and you're not a Christian yet, maybe this is the day that you come to Jesus Christ to accept his sacrifice on the cross for you, to accept his kindness and his love, to receive the hope of life with him forever and to enjoy him. So maybe this is a prayer for all of us this morning a call and an invitation to our own hearts and souls. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, that we may glorify God and enjoy him forever.
In this season of Eastertide, let us declare our faith in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's say together, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried, he was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And afterwards, he appeared to his followers and to all the apostles. This we have received and this we believe. Amen. And the collect for today. God, our Redeemer, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son, grant that as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his continual presence in us he may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now we have our intercession. Circles of prayer. Let us for a moment think of our prayers as being like circles in a pond made by throwing a stone into the water. The surface of the pond is still and silent. The stone drops into the middle and we see the first circle emerge. In this circle are people closest to us, family, friends, the irreplaceable ones. There aren't many in this first small circle, but we know them well. Their strength and their struggles, their enjoyment and their special needs. Let us pray for them. circle spreads. Look now at the second circle. Here are the people we know well, perhaps work with, go out with sometimes. Here are the more distant members of the family whom we don't make contact with as much as we ought, but we care for them nonetheless. Here are the neighbours, friends from a while ago, people who we send Christmas cards to. There are many needs let us remember some and pray for them. The circle spreads again. Look now at the third and fourth circles. People we know less well. We see them sometimes at the school gate. Every day we exchange a friendly word. We meet them in the shop or out with the dog and we greet them in the pub. There are hundreds of people out there in these circles, too many to pray for individually. And in any case, we don't know their needs. But they are known to God. He has loved them from their birth. Let them be washed by these circles of prayer. The circles spread right out. They reach the edge of the pond one after another they lap against the banks. Our prayers extend to the ends of the earth for all God's creation is the object of his mercy. Our prayer is an act of love for the world. Let us delight in encompassing within the circle of God's extraordinary care and keeping. In these far circles hold everything in the love of the Father. Lord God, our prayer this morning is a small pebble thrown into the large expanse of need. We thank you that your love is greater still, and we entrust every circle of our prayers to your generous mercy and grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour has taught us, together we pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we join together for our final hymn. in this day's journey. Dawn on our darkness and open our eyes to praise you for your creation and to see the work that you set before us today. Take us and use us to bring to others the new life you give in Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us all. Amen. And as we prepare to part, let's bless one another in the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.